everyone. Welcome to this lecture on Is Peer Review a Bad Idea? Thanks for tuning in. My name is Remco Heysen. I work at the University of Western Australia and the University of Groningen. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm delivering this lecture from Wajuk Nyungar land, land that has never been ceded. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, today's lecture focuses on my paper, Is Peer Review a Good Idea? published in the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science and co-written with Liam Kofi Bright, who uh, is a fantastic co-author to work with over the past several years. We've collaborated several times. And you can find the paper at this link that's provided on the slide. Topic of this paper, as is hopefully clear, is peer review, and more specifically, peer review of scientific manuscripts, as opposed to grant proposals, conference abstracts, or etc. Traditionally, commonly, um, peer review is carried out at scientific journals. I'm going to call this a closed editor uh, journal solicited model of peer review. The editor solicits reviews from a group of reviewers, typically two or three. And this peer review model is closed in the sense that only the editor, the author, and maybe the other reviewers get to see the reviews. In our paper, we propose to uh, abolish this system and move instead to what we call an open crowdsource model of peer review. Um, in which an author decides for, for themselves when they think their paper is ready for publication. And when they do so, they make the paper available uh, on a server, a preprint server or a publication server, we might now call it, where it's uh, subject to open crowdsourced peer review. So anyone can provide a review and anyone can read any of the reviews that have been written for this particular paper. We imagine that reviews and numerical scores are kept in the same location where the paper is stored on that archive. And we would encourage um, keeping in place the disciplinary norm of public discussion of new work so that people still should spend time peer reviewing just as they're doing now. And the argument that we pursue in this paper is that um, open crowdsource peer review is on present evidence uh, superior to closed journal solicited peer review. And we carry out this argument by considering a range of factors in the social epistemology of science that are actively or potentially affected by changing how we organize peer review. And we argue that for each of these factors that based on the present and relevant empirical evidence, these factors will either be positively influenced by switching to uh, open crowdsource peer review, or the results are neutral, essentially indifferent, or uncertain, um, where we really need more research to tell what the effects might be. And in particular, there are no negative factors. So the overall argument then is that uh, by changing to open crowdsource peer review, you improve some things and not harm any particular aspect of the social epistemology of science. So in this lecture, I'm going to briefly walk through those factors and then end, since this is an African science lecture, with a bit of speculation on how peer review affects researchers in Africa in particular. So here's an overview of the factors, the positive, the neutral, and the uncertain factors that um, we consider in our paper. For reasons of time, I'll go over them very quickly in this lecture. But if you're interested in any particular factor, you can either pause the lecture and have a more detailed look at the slide for that, for that factor, or you can, of course, turn to the published paper and read in more detail about it there. All right, so a quick overview of the positive factors, first of all. So moving to open crowdsource peer review means publishing papers before you peer review them. So that's going to speed up scientific progress in making work available earlier. It will not spend as much time hidden away during a closed peer review process. 
Second positive factor is that scientists are more free to decide how they allocate their time between uh, spending time on peer review versus other activities and also which papers they choose to spend their time peer reviewing. We think this would be a good thing. A third factor is the current gender skew in publications. Men publish more than women, and this is presumably largely due to gender bias or the expectation of gender bias in peer review. So taking away the expectations of reviewers and an editor um, will allow men and women to hold their work to their own standards of quality, um, and in that sense, making those standards perhaps a bit more equal. And again, we expect uh, both epistemic and ethical positive consequences from this. Library resources. Um, currently, we spend a lot of money uh, at university libraries on subscription journals. By moving to an uh, archive style model of publishing in which all the work is open access, we can save a lot of these costs um, and thereby have more money available within to be to be fed back into science rather than um, going to private shareholders. There will obviously be effects for scientific careers because um, the journals you publish in currently play a big role in determining the status of your career. Uh, but we think that by having journal prestige be a less important factor, Hopefully, the, this will be replaced by the quality of the person's actual work. And so we expect, again, positive effects here. There is currently an oversized influence of gatekeepers, of a small group of editors that determine who gets to be published in the prestigious journals in a given field. And we think that this is on the whole a bad thing. It would be better to have a more democratic uh, scientific evaluation where opinions of the field at large uh, play a serious role. And again, we think that this is both ethically and epistemically uh, beneficial to scientific fields. Final positive factors, considering the notion of epistemic sorting. So the claim here from, a, from an opponent of our proposal is that closed journal solicited peer review creates a useful hierarchy of scientific work based on merits, right? So it makes it easy for people to find the best work by looking in the top journals. Call this epistemic sorting. We claim against this that if you think that it is in fact useful uh, and possible to have a useful hierarchy of scientific work based on merits, then open crowdsourced peer review can actually do it better. It's worth noting that in the original paper, is peer review a good idea? We listed epistemic sorting as a neutral factor. Um, so this detailed argument that actually open crowdsourced peer review can do it better is in a follow-up paper, Jury Theorems for Peer Review, that you can find on Phil's I archive at the link given on the slide. So those are the positive factors. Let's move to the neutral factors. First of all, fraud detection. Peer review, whether open or closed, crowdsourced or journal solicited, is generally no good at this. So we just need to rely on other things to detect fraud. Um, the way we organize peer review is orthogonal to this. Similar point about herding, right? So some people think that um, the fact that we have scientific journals encourages a kind of fashion-driven science, people to herd into particular topics based on what's popular in a given journal at a given time. We actually think that this has little to do with journals in particular and more with the attention economy of scientific work more generally. People will have an incentive to write on topics they think others are interested in, regardless of whether they are journals or other ways of distributing attention. So again, we think this is orthogonal to how peer review is organized in detail. Let's move to the uncertain factors. So these are basically objections to our argument that we think are uh, under-evidenced. So first of all, the notion of prestige bias um, and the Matthew effect. So the, the objection here is that the current system of journal publication lets small fish seize the headlines, right? A graduate student or um, a, a junior researcher or someone from a 
marginalized uh, background can publish in nature or science or whatever and thereby grab everyone's attention whereas in an open crowdsource peer review model there is no such way to redirect people's attention and so all attention will go to the antecedently famous right those who already have an easy time grabbing people's attention so our first response to this is to note that there is no evidence supporting this right and more specifically we know that journals and journal peer review is also subject to prestige bias. So we'd like to see evidence that there's reason to expect that the occasional small fish, right, a grad student can publish in Nature, but it's very rare, that that actually outweighs um, the kind of uh, prestige bias you would see in an open crowdsource peer review um, model. And this is not just a glib, like you don't have any evidence for this kind of objection. We really think people should research this, right? This is an open research question. It's something that can be answered because math and physics operate on roughly the model we propose. So we can actually do a study and see how it's worked out there. And someone should do this so that we can know how seriously to take this worry. Second response to this point is that if you're so worried about small fish, right? Junior researchers, marginalized researchers, then you should do more than just rely on the journal system to solve this problem. You should actively think about ways to attract attention to their work. And we think this would be good, but it's, again, mostly orthogonal to how you organize peer review. Okay. Second uncertain factor is that reviewer scores might be manipulated in an open peer review system um, by mobs, by people with a political ax to grind, people who are not sort of motivated to make science better, people come in from the outside and review bomb papers, you know, give bad scores to a paper based on, yeah, having some sort of ax to grind. So we think here in particular, an experimental attitude is important, right? There are several things you could try to do to prevent this and would have to be found out through experience, which one works best. You can rely on the experience also other social media have had um, tentatively, we suggest a system that's kind of like Rotten Tomatoes, where you distinguish between recognized experts and what I call putative experts, so that's everyone else. Um, and if you see a strong divergence in opinions between the recognized experts and the putative experts, then that's a signal that something might be awry. And you, know, you don't know just on that basis whether the problem is that the recognized experts are sort of stuck in the rut or in groupthink and the outsiders are bringing in new, new ideas, or whether it's like this kind of manipulation or review bombing uh, that's the issue, but at least you'll know that something is up. So we do think there are ways around this. All right, so that in a nutshell is our argument for changing peer review. And now I'd like to turn attention specifically to the effects of peer review on researchers in Africa. So first of all, I think that the current model of closed uh, journal solicited peer review, its downsides, some of which I've highlighted, are gonna be particularly bad, are particularly bad for researchers in Africa, right? So the point about library resources, libraries spending a lot of money on journal subscriptions, um, you know, in Africa, as well as other places, of course, you're going to find a lot of underfunded research libraries that struggle to pay these subscription fees, such that the researchers at those universities do not have access to all the research that they might like to have access to, which hinders their own research. Uh, second, the point about gatekeepers that I made earlier, right? So if you have an editor with a lot of influence on which type of work receives attention in a given area. And if you imagine that that gatekeeper is perhaps biased or discriminates against people on the basis of race or nationality, say, then you have a recipe for a really bad situation, right? Might be a whole field in which one or a small number of editors can really suppress the research of whole groups of people on the basis of races or race or nationality. Um, so that could be a really bad situation. And third, the Matthew effect, which I mentioned a couple of slides ago, um, leads to, is, is this phenomenon that it's easier to get attention for your work if you're already famous and hard if you're not already famous. 
and since most many researchers in Africa are more tend to be are more likely to be on the margins of their research area, um, it means that they're likely to be on the bad side of the Matthew effect on average. Now, will something like our proposal, open crowdsource peer review, make things better for researchers in Africa? Um, I think the results here are going to be mixed. So on the point of library sources, I think clearly yes. And more generally, the open science and open access movements are going to be, uh, insofar as they're successful, uh, should be really beneficial <clears throat> to researchers in Africa um, because now they're going to have access to a greater variety of work and that's going to improve the quality of their own research. When it comes to gatekeepers and the biases that they might have, uh, obviously, it'd be really good if a particularly influential editor that is biased or discriminates um, would be sort of taken down a peg, would have less influence over what receives attention in their field. So in that sense, open crowdsource peer review could make things better in such a field. But there's a big but here in the sense that, um, you know, many people are biased, many people discriminate. And... Um, open crowdsource peer review, insofar as there are a lot of people with biases around, will still be sensitive to that to a degree. So you cannot solve all the problems related to bias just by changing your model of peer review. And finally, on the Matthew effect, I've suggested that there's no good evidence that the Matthew effect will be worse with open crowdsource peer review, but I've also not given any reason to think that it will be better. So on the whole, um, with the lack of evidence that there is, uh, I see no reason to think that the Matthew effect would be either better or worse for researchers in Africa, depending on which model of peer review is being used. Right, so on that last point, as I already said, more research is needed and that holds quite generally, right? So peer review practices and their effects on researchers in Africa in particular are just not very well understood. I've not been able to find any empirical studies um, specifically looking at how peer review practices affect researchers in Africa. And so what we should do is go out and study how both current peer review practices and alternatives such as the one that I've suggested actually affect researchers in Africa and what would be best for them and what would be best for everyone. Um, what makes our science work as well as possible. And in this area, as is often the case, right, it's easy to come up with hypotheses. I've just given you a few on the last couple of slides. But what's much harder to do is actually doing the hard work of gathering the evidence, providing the evidence-based um, arguments so that we have a good reason to actually, good basis for actually making good decisions about how to organize peer review. All right, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention.